Hello everyone and uh, welcome to this lecture on space law. Uh, my name is John Vivian Prashant and I am an engineer at the Indian Space Research Organization. I have been working in the aerospace sector for close to 15 years and I have a passion for space exploration and innovation. So space law is a fascinating and emerging field of study that uh, deals with legal aspects of human activities in outer space and it covers topics such as the ownership and use of natural resources, the protection of the environment, the regulation of communications and navigation, uh, the settlement of disputes and the prevention of conflicts. So space law is also an interdisciplinary field that uh, requires a combination of technical, legal and uh, policy expertise. Uh, so that is why I decided to pursue a master's degree in space and telecommunications law at uh, Nalsar Hyderabad, which is uh, one of the leading law schools in India. So in this lecture, I will give you an introduction to space law, its history, sources, principles and challenges. I will discuss uh, some of the current issues and developments in this field, uh, such as commercialization of space activities, exploration of the moon and the governance of space debris. So this lecture is designed for general audience of lawyers and engineers, as well as inquisitive college students who are interested in learning more about this uh, exciting and uh, important topic. I hope you will enjoy this lecture and find it informative and engaging. Uh, so let's begin with the slides. So this will be the uh, general flow of the content and slides. So the first three slides will be the meaning and scope of space law and a couple of slides on historical developments of space law and then we'll move on to sources of space law and all throughout this uh, slides i'll uh, raise the pertinent questions and the study material which has to be referred further or the concepts which have to be you know uh, further uh, explored so when we talk about space law we definitely need to start our discussion from international law and uh, you could read more about uh, international law and the laws of nations which was a term coined by jeremy bentham in 19, uh, 1780 and uh, it, it is something which mainly aims to maintain international peace and security among different states and uh, you should also go through uh, John Austin's uh, views on international law and uh, when he says that, you know, uh, international law is not a true law, he said that uh, international law cannot be called law proper in the true sense uh, because it has neither sovereign legislative authority to enact law nor there is an adequate sanction behind it. Uh, moreover, there is no enforcement agency which can enforce it as a body of rules. So when such a thing gets said about uh, international law, then uh, uh, you need to reflect upon this statement and as to how it would uh, apply to space law, which, uh, which is a you know, direct uh, uh, derivative of international law. Uh, so why study space law? Uh, so space law is the legal framework and principles uh, that govern the use and exploration of outer space uh, by states and other actors. And uh, space law is important and relevant because uh, space is a unique and uh, valuable domain uh, for scientific discoveries, technological innovations, uh, economic development and social benefit at the end of the whole process. Uh, however, space is also a contested and uh, vulnerable domain uh, for security, stability and sustainability. So space law faces new challenges and opportunities uh, due to the rapid uh, changes and developments in the field of uh, outer space as uh, exemplified by recent conflict in Ukraine uh, where commercial space capabilities played a significant role. Uh, therefore, studying space law can help us understand the current and future issues and implications of space activities and uh, contribute to the peaceful and uh, responsible use of space for the benefit of all humankind. Uh, so space law is serious business, uh, but some people make a joke of it 
like lunar embassy uh, whose uh, ad i have just uh, pasted on my slide here so they claim that they sell moon land online and uh, also land on the mars uh, basically they're breaking the space law that says uh, no one can own the moon or any part of space so don't end up buying all this and waste your money it's a mockery of space law basically and uh, the sole reason that why we require laws in place which uh, will definitely ensure that these kind of uh, scams don't take place in the future so space law is important because uh, it addresses the legal issues and implications of uh, various events and developments in space uh, such as these three examples which I have cited here, uh, like the launch of Sputnik 1, uh, the first satellite uh, which sparked the space age and space race and uh, raised questions about the definition, boundaries and use of space. And uh, then the Apollo Soyuz astronaut uh, rescue mission, uh, the, which was the first joint mission between US and USSR which uh, basically demonstrated the cooperation and uh, risks of space activities and relevance of rescue agreement which assists astronauts and space objects in distress and uh, then there's in this interesting case of asgardia which is a self-proclaimed space nation which basically challenges the existing rules and norms of space law uh, such as recognition of states and ownership of space and the jurisdictions and the liability for space actors. So these examples illustrate how space law is evolving and adapting to the new realities and needs of space exploration and exploitation and how it can contribute to the peaceful and responsible use of space for all. So having looked at the uh, requirement and the need to study space law, now let's move on and uh, let's look into the meaning and scope of space law in a theoretical sense. Uh, so space law is the law that uh, shapes our future in space. Uh, it sets the rules and principles for how states can explore and use space for a common good of humankind and it safeguards the space environment and prevents its abuse for war or destruction and it responds to new challenges and opportunities of space innovation and discovery and if you're looking for an exact definition of space law so this is the verbatim definition of space law from the first two three lines of uh, United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs website. Uh, so you can just uh, read through this, pause, pause the slide and read through this definition. And when we are talking about uh, space law and space resources basically, or for that matter any resources, uh, a concept known as the tragedy of commons is something we'll have to discuss. And basically the tra tragedy of commons is a problem that occurs when people use a public resource for their own benefit uh, without considering the impact on others or the future. Uh, for example, overfishing can lead to depletion of fish stock and uh, the loss of biodiversity. Uh, the tragedy of commons can also apply to outer space, which is a common resource for all humankind. The International Space Station uh, shown in this picture is an example of cooperative effort to use space for peaceful and scientific purposes. Uh, however, there are also risks of uh, space pollution, congestion, conflict and exploitation uh, that could threaten the sustainability and security of space environment. Um, therefore, we need to develop and uh, follow space law which uh, can help us avoid the tragedy of commons in space. So yeah, so this slide is to shed some light on to some economic numbers, some financial numbers. 
Uh, so if uh, any of you are thinking that all this is very theoretical and uh, is space law any, any day soon going to uh, get me some earning out of it. So look at these figures and numbers and uh, like these countries have ambitious space programs that aim to explore and use space for scientific, commercial and strategic purposes. And these programs involve legal issues and implications such as international cooperation, responsibility, liability and security. Uh, so you can research the revenue of top 100 law firms in the US and see the size and importance of uh, legal service sector which is also diversifying into space. Uh, for example, some law firms are offering specialized services in space law, such as advising on contracts, licenses, insurance, intellectual property, and dispute resolution. So these services are needed by the growing number of uh, space actors involved in these activities, such as uh, the governments, companies, and individuals. Uh, so moving on to the types of space activities, so they are very diverse and complex. Uh, they are classified by their uh, purpose such as scientific, commercial, uh, military, civil or governmental. And they can also be classified by their nature such as uh, launch, orbit, re-entry, landing or exploration. And uh, space activities are governed by different uh, legal regimes and obligations depending on their classification. And uh, space activities may also involve various legal issues such as uh, jurisdiction, liability, registration, licensing and authorization. Uh, so trying to understand the difference between air and space law. Uh, air law regulates the use of airspace by states uh, while space law applies to outer space. And uh, air law is based on the principle of air sovereignty, which gives the states the right to control their own airspace and enforce their own aviation law. Uh, whereas space law, on the other hand, is based on the principle of uh, global commons, which gives all states equal rights and freedoms to access and uh, use outer space for peaceful purposes. And uh, while that we are this slide, I would like the learners to uh, explore more about the common line, the significance of the 100 kilometer altitude and uh, other territorial matters. Uh, so now we move on to looking at the historical developments in space law. Uh, so in this slide, we will uh, discuss the historical and uh, legal significance of uh, Sputnik 1. Uh, the first artificial satellite launched into orbit by Soviet Union on uh, 4th October 1957. So uh, the Sputnik 1 was a major milestone in human history as it opened the door to exploration and use of outer space. Uh, but it also sparked a fierce uh, competition between the Soviet Union and the United States, uh, the two superpowers of the Cold War era, to achieve supremacy in space. And uh, Sputnik 1 also raised several uh, legal questions, uh, such as how to define and delimit our outer space, whether states have the right to fly over other states' territory in space, and uh, who is liable for any damage caused by space objects. And uh, Sputnik 1 led to the recognition of outer space as a new domain for international law and cooperation and definitely paved the way for the development of space treaties and institutions that we see live today. Uh, so in consequence of the launch of the Sputnik uh, is what unfolded is the uh, space race and uh, the Cold War basically. And uh, I would like to suggest the learners to look into some of the uh, YouTube videos on the space race subject because it's a uh, a uh, lot of uh, things to be covered in that. So this is something for self-study. So this is uh, just to show you the timeline of major uh, space related landmark laws and uh, organizations which came into force. So in 1959, uh, like two years after the uh, Sputnik launch came the United Nations uh, Committee on Peaceful Use of Outer Space. And uh, then in 1967 was the landmark Outer Space Treaty. 
and uh, then in the uh, 1970s you had uh, some other un treaties on outer space and then again in the 80s and 90s you had some un principles on outer space which will be looking in detail in the forthcoming slides so the committee on uh, peaceful use of outer space uh, was made as a subsidiary body of the united nations uh, general assembly and established in 1959 and uh, it's the main forum for discussing and negotiating international agreements and principles on outer space and uh, you can look in more into the two subcommittees and uh, their uh, area of work and uh, is there regarding the scientific and technical subcommittee and also the legal subcommittee and uh, they uh, play a key role in developing and promoting space law at the global level so please uh, do a further reading on this uh, so the crux of the outer space treaty is that uh, outer space is a common heritage of mankind and should be used for peaceful and cooperative purposes by all states uh, without violating international law or the rights and interests of other states and this basically is the main treaty from which the future treaties derive a lot and uh, i would uh, suggest that the learners go through each and every clause of this treaty in detail uh, so this treaty also talks about the rules and uh, conventions to be followed uh, regarding uh, weaponization of space and uh, regarding the utilization of uh, celestial bodies for resources uh can considering astronauts as envoys of mankind and uh, regarding the uh, liabilities of damages caused in space uh, so please do go through all the uh, clauses of this treaty in detail and uh, as far as the artemis accords is concerned which was greatly in news recently uh, for uh, india joining the artemis accords Uh, so in this slide, I will try to show the similarities and differences between the Outer Space Treaty and the Artemis Accords, and uh, you can the learners can uh, go through these points, and uh, while going through these points, also try to uh, ponder over uh, uh, why basically uh, such a treaty was required and why India entered it at this point of time. What are the international relation implications what are the political implications and uh, other such things and uh, well uh, you can also look into the uh, differences which are pointed out here in this slide as in which is legally binding and which is not legally binding and what are the implications of this uh, when it comes to the sovereignty issues of a nation so please do go through all these points so what followed from the outer space treaty was uh, the set of these four uh, agreements and conventions uh, being the rescue agreement uh, the liability convention uh, the registration convention and the moon agreement so all these treaties and conventions and agreements are uh, very detailed subjects in themselves which uh, will be covered in the future lectures of this series and as far as the moon treaty is concerned i would like the learners to ponder over and uh, research out uh, as to why many countries didn't become parties to this treaty and uh, why this treaty sort of gets called as a failure uh, approach and uh, what were the reasons for this and uh, what could be expected in the future and how this all relates to even the artemis accord so please do uh, research out all these things so in the 1980s and 90s uh, uh, we have some un principles a set of five principles basically the declaration of legal principles broadcasting principles and the remote sensing principles the nuclear power sources principle the benefits declaration so kindly go through all these principles in detail because these all are derived uh, basically from the treaties we discussed earlier and uh, 
they all are related to the outer space treaty so please try to make a good understanding of all these uh, principles because this is the crux of the whole point of space law to, to be understood clearly these principles should be clear and uh, the reasoning which went behind to formulate these also pay attention to the dates which they came up in and uh, what was the historical relevance of all these dates and uh, why these uh, principles came up during that time and what relevance they had what impact they had so let's look into some of the challenges in space law and uh, which are uh, the product of some recent technological developments uh, like, uh, for example, uh, we need to have clear rules and laws regarding uh, asteroid mining, lunar exploration, and human space flight. And uh, also, with the emergence of uh, private sector into the space arena, we have uh, many more complications arising which have to be looked into and uh, also we have to think about uh, the weaponization and militarization aspects and how uh, cyber attacks can be dealt with how espionage uh, can be dealt with how what should be the rules and regulations when it comes to remote sensing of other states by uh, rogue states so please try to go into all these things in more detail when we are talking about the challenges, definitely uh, space debris is a very pertinent uh, issue here. And uh, we all know that the rate at which we are sending satellites into the space, the space is getting polluted to the extent that uh, our astronomers and uh, are not able to even do proper uh, space exploration via their telescopes because there is so much of space debris which is causing obstruction and all these uh, observations so there there are a lot of uh, you know new active debris removal uh, methods like you know they capture the debris and uh, there are also other means like by lasers and magnets and whatnot and uh, now when you, when you are looking into space debris, uh, please do look into uh, what are the natural or the usual methods by which uh, usually satellites are deorbited and uh, after that deorbit, how what happens to them, how they get annihilated or how they end up as uh, space debris and uh, remain there and uh, for what amount of time they remain there and what all are the problems they cause by uh, being there to the uh, other space exploration efforts. So please do go into the technical aspects of this also of, of deorbiting of satellites and what are the new methodologies which are being used so that uh, such kind of debris are reduced. Uh, so here on we look into the sources of space law and here onwards uh, basically the slides become too verbose and uh, i would request the learners to pause the slides and uh, go through the content and the text very carefully and uh, patiently so here i would uh, ask the learners to go through what are the primary sources of space law and the secondary sources of space law and uh, what are basically legally binding and non-binding and now in the analysis part of whatever treaties and uh, principles we saw in the previous slides. So it is up to the learners to do this analysis for themselves and just, uh, you know, uh, get some kind of uh, direction from the points I have presented in the slides as to in what lines any treaty has to be analyzed. And uh, the same analysis can be done for this principles on outer space and other statutes which we read through. And uh, for the UN resolutions and uh, the guidelines and best practices on outer space. And for national laws 
and for customary laws and in case of uh, judicial decisions as far as the indian space policy which was released this year uh, so it is basically a set of guidelines uh, which tries to uh, promote private sector engagement in space space arena and uh, that is keeping in line with the atmanirbhar and making india campaigns of the government of india and uh, this policy basically defines clearly and demarcates the role of isro nsil and in space and uh, isro basically uh, keeps itself with the r and d aspect of space research and uh, the nsil deals with the uh, regular launches and in space which deals with the regulatory and promotion aspects so this is just a very uh, small document please uh, do go through the whole document and here i have just mentioned some interesting space law related cases uh, like uh, for example uh, there were questions raised as to whether flying an aircraft over private land a uh, constitutes taking of pro property rights so this was a case in the us and uh, whether uh, you know uh, if someone gets injured by a defective component of a nasa rocket uh, can he sue the manufacturer so please do go through this and when it comes to space law in india i guess uh, this is the most uh, important of all the antix corporation versus uh, davis multimedia uh, which was re relating to the you know cancelling of the uh, agreement to lease satellite as transponders uh, for multimedia services so please go through this case in complete its complete entirety to give you a lot of uh, formation and uh, knowledge as to what were the bodies involved and uh, how these kind of cases take place and uh, how space law related any uh, provisions were used in this so i hope uh, i have helped in you know shedding some light to the introductory aspects of space law as in just giving you some timelines and some brief uh, skeleton descriptions of the laws and principles and treaties so i wish all of you space lawyers a very happy educational journey and to boldly go where no lawyer has gone before thank you very much